Good evening, I'm Adrian Arsenault. Andrew is off tonight. Former WE employees speak out about the charity's ties to the finance minister, saying WE executives pressured them to attend events hosted by Bill Morneau. It was kind of uncomfortable for us. Some of us weren't necessarily, you know, uh, liberal supporters. A CBC News exclusive. Most BC students will be heading back to school full time. I would like to hear a real plan. I'd like to hear what the classrooms are going to look like. How many children will be in a classroom? The plan to keep kids safe in September. And the fall also means flu season. If you had flu, if you had COVID, it's going to be really hard to tell. What can be done to prevent overlapping outbreaks? I did it. Oh, my bear's home. The stolen teddy bear, a special gift from a mother to her daughter before she died, has been found. I was just happy that she had it back. I was happy to see she was happy. The reunion we all need to see right now. This is The National. On the eve of the Prime Minister's testimony about the WE charity controversy, we are learning more about the organization's ties to the finance minister from former employees. Tonight, they are telling CBC News about the pressure they felt from WE executives to support Bill Morneau to attend a party he hosted and a government pre-budget event. Farah Morali has the CBC News exclusive. Bill Morneau thanked guests for coming to his holiday party in 2018, but not everyone was happy to be there. No, none of us want to go. It would have been an after-hours event in the evening. CBC News spoke to three former WE charity employees. We agreed to conceal their identities. They said a high-level WE executive pressured them to attend an event that was important to Craig Kielberger. What they didn't know was that the event was a holiday party for Toronto Centre MP Bill Morneau. It was kind of uncomfortable for us because some of us weren't necessarily, you know, uh, liberal supporters. We Charity is a non-partisan organization. The Kielbergers say they've worked with governments of all political stripes. CBC News spoke with other WE employees who said they felt pressure to be part of another event, this time with Bill Morneau in the role of finance minister. I was really disappointed that I wasn't on stage, so I couldn't high-five Craig. In 2017, the federal government held a pre-budget meeting at WE's headquarters. Two former WE employees told CBC News, I don't feel like I had a choice but to attend. Another said an email was sent around stating that bodies were needed to fill the room and give Bill Morneau a big quote, we welcome. Federal income tax law states that charities cannot devote resources, even human resources, to support a political party or candidate. We spoke to 15 former WE employees who told us they felt they couldn't challenge the Kielbergers or executive staff. Many want to speak out now but say they can't because of this, a non-disclosure agreement. We obtained this NDA from a former employee. It forbids them from making disparaging remarks about the organization. James Powell is WE's former head of branding. He's posted a series of videos on Instagram calling on WE to drop his NDA. It's extremely restrictive, and that's where I responded the way that I did in my first video, saying, release me from that. Let me speak my truth. WE Charity called the allegations, quote, a significant mischaracterization of events that said in part, we Charity and Me to We Social Enterprise has never circulated an invitation to staff to attend a political event. We Charity will participate and or circulate information to staff about local community events. A spokesperson for Bill Morneau says regarding the 2018 holiday party, the We organization has not received any invitations to any partisan or political events in Toronto Centre. Morneau has apologized twice for his involvement in the We Charity controversy, and the Ethics Commissioner is investigating. Farah Morali, CBC News. Toronto. The Ethics Commissioner announced today he will be expanding his investigation into Bill Morneau to include the $41,000 reimbursement of WE-sponsored travel expenses. All this as the Prime Minister and his Chief of Staff, Katie Telford, prepare to testify before the Finance Committee tomorrow. Tomorrow we want the Prime Minister to come to tell the, the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. The Liberals are trying to limit this to one hour. So the Prime Minister can come in, big, give a big uh, grand speech uh, and limit the questioning to 11 minutes by Conservative members. This evening, the committee passed a Conservative motion to have Trudeau appear for at least three hours on his own and for Telford to appear for at least two hours. The PMO says they will be in touch with the committee to work out the timing.
And so for a closer look at what we should expect tomorrow, let's bring in our chief political correspondent, Rosemary Barton. So, Rosie, what will you in particular be watching for? You know, the, the central question, Adrian, for the Prime Minister tomorrow is a pretty easy one. How did you not see that this would be a problem? Justin Trudeau has said it was a mistake not to recuse himself from the decision. He said he knew his mother and brother had been paid for speaking engagements, but he didn't know the details. So why not? He'll also be expected to explain more about how this program came about, why We Charity was the only organization able to do the job, how much he had uh, to say as a part of the development of that program. But Fundamentally, tomorrow comes down to a demonstration of the Prime Minister's judgment when making decisions and why now in his fifth year that continues to be a problem for him. And so correct me if I'm wrong, it's not unheard of for a Prime Minister to appear at a parliamentary committee, but it is unusual, right? Yeah, it's unusual because the Prime Minister doesn't have to agree to come. He can't be compelled to do it. And in the midst of a controversy, you just don't really see it very often. So there'll be a part of that political theater tomorrow. And in many ways, it's also about the opposition parties flexing their muscles tomorrow, really showing the Prime Minister and the government what they are capable of in a minority government situation. And in many ways, just getting the Prime Minister in the chair tomorrow to answer some of these questions is a victory for them. All right, Rosie, as always, thank you. Thanks, Adrian. CBC News will have special coverage with Rosie tomorrow ahead of the House of Commons Finance Committee starting at 2.30 p.m. Eastern on CBC TV, CBC News Network and on GEM. And tomorrow night, Rosie will be back here with a special at issue panel. Now to another CBC News exclusive. The incident happened years ago, but the sting is still fresh. An anti-Islamic email sent by someone in the department that oversees enforcement of Canada's no-fly list. Our story sparked an investigation, and now, as Ashley Burke reports, the findings point to a much wider problem. Former Transport Canada employee Renee Suderich says it shouldn't have taken 12 years for the government to denounce a racist email she received. I think it's a national tragedy that it takes media exposure for the department to do the right thing. The email contains an offensive parody of a Frank Sinatra song. Strangers on my flight, turbans they're packing, wondering if they might plan a hijacking. It goes on to threaten violence against travelers wearing turbans. Last year, CBC News reported then Transport Canada Superintendent Mark Haynes sent the song to colleagues in 2008 and wrote, This is great, they should play this non stop at all airports. His department oversees the enforcement of Canada's no-fly list, which has been criticized for mistakenly flagging children as security threats. Now a report into the internal investigation reveals not one, but ten employees sent emails containing the derogatory song violating workplace policies. Transport Canada admits it knew about the email three years ago, but says it didn't look into it thoroughly until CBC's story and said in retrospect this was an error which has been corrected with the latest investigation. Honestly, it's quite ridiculous, and that stuff sh it shouldn't, it shouldn't take a long time to deal with it. 22-year-old student Adam Ahmed and his two brothers' names have been on Canada's no-fly list since they were children. His family says the handling of the incident shows systemic racism exists at all levels of the department. It's loud and clear that they need to fix this stuff. They need to fix it so the public can trust them again, especially with sensitive issues like security. I mean, these are people that oversee security, oversee the list that my kids are on. Six employees who sent the email still work for Transport Canada. The department's now reviewing what disciplinary action it could take. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. The rate of new COVID-19 cases in Canada is still relatively low and still slowly rising, but the regional picture appears to be shifting. Together, Central Canada, that's Ontario and Quebec, is still the main source of new cases, but Western Canada, we're talking BC, Alberta and the Prairies, well, it's catching up. As the West sees more clusters, the regional difference has narrowed. Striking, given the West has about half of Central Canada's population. But new cases and new challenges are emerging across this country. In Quebec, summer camps have been open for weeks. And as Thomas Degla shows us, that has had some consequences. As the summer drags on, more scrubbing will be needed. With COVID-19 invading some day camps, forcing parents to consider 
at what point they might pull their kids out. Of course, if there's a case in the camp where my kids are, I probably would, but uh, otherwise uh, I'm pretty comfortable. If there was a bigger spread, I might hold them back, but for, for the time being, it doesn't bother me. They're facing that tough choice in more and more places, with summer camps across eight Quebec municipalities having confirmed infections, though some were contained to a single case. None worse than at this camp on Montreal's South Shore, where 27 children and staff have tested positive. It's closed for two weeks as the case count is expected to rise. En fait, on pas surpris. anne frédéric Morin with the Quebec Camp Association says while cases don't come as a surprise, they may still be worrisome. There are contact tracing plans in place to stomp out wider outbreaks and consider that camp with all those cases had staff wearing masks. Even the sign says hand washing is mandatory. One parent who asked to remain unnamed tells us he fell ill after his daughter tested positive. The measures are quite impressive at that day camp compared to the other day camps. So that's what makes it so scary that uh, so many people uh, got it with all the measures that are in place. No matter the measures, physical distancing isn't easy and high touch areas abound. Think about that sports gear and other shared material. Children tend not to be major spreaders of the virus, but the problem is a low risk doesn't mean zero. Perhaps it's all a glimpse of what to expect in the fall as school returns and the virus remains. Thomas Dagg, New CBC News, Toronto. From kindergarten to grade 12, most BC students will be back in school in September. Today, the provincial government announced plans for a full return to class. The full endorsement of parents and teachers, though, that's another matter. Greg Rasmussen explains. Guys, you're doing a good job there. After much waiting, six-year-old Fiona and Lily now know they'll be off to school for grade one in September, and they'll be going full time. But for their mom, anxiety and uncertainty. I would like to hear a real plan. I'd like to hear what the classrooms are going to look like. How many children will be in a classroom? I want to hear about cleaning protocols. Instead today, the province announced the broad strokes, centered around the creation of what are called learning groups. The principle behind these learning groups is to create groups of student and staff who will remain together throughout the school year or term and who primarily interact only with each other. Schedules will be varied to keep these groups from mixing with others. For elementary students, there will be as large as 60 people. For high schoolers, 120. That is a, a, a very effective way of trying to, of reducing um, potential for transmission. Also announced $45 million for masks and hygiene measures. So we think it would be for the teachers' union, though, September. concerns about a lack of consultation. We need a lot more time, and there's a lot of questions that need to be answered. For many parents and students, mixed feelings over today's announcement. I'm a little nervous to go back, but I'm happy to see my friends. Mixing in halls and classrooms with others is a worry for this grade 7's family, but so is ongoing isolation. For um, kids been aged, there are, is a lot of stress and anxiety just being social with your friends and trying to fit in. Going from a very small family bubble to a full classroom is a big step for some. It seems scary um, when we've felt so insulated up until this point. Many of the details are being left to the local school boards to sort out just how this will work come September. Greg Rasmussen, CBC News, Vancouver. We'll find out tomorrow Ontario's plan for schools in September. But today, a group of health experts led by Toronto Sick Kids weighed in with its recommendations. Our greatest opportunity to meet our children's needs and their well-being at this moment in time is to carefully think about how to plan for a safe, successful return to daily school. So among the recommendations for reopening, smaller class sizes, cohorting younger students to avoid mixing with other classes, masks for high schoolers when physical distancing can't be maintained, but they aren't recommending masks for elementary students, and cancelling high-risk activities such as choir and band. For nearly two weeks, Ontario's entry into Stage 3 reopening has come with a big asterisk. Toronto and other heavily populated areas have been stuck at stage two, but that is now changing. 
we're announcing today that Toronto and Peel Region can proceed to Stage 3 on Friday, July 31st at 12.01 a.m. And this is happening as Ontario reports less than 100 new cases for the first time since March. Stage 3 means reopen playgrounds and indoor gatherings of up to 50 people, but Toronto is moving to have additional restrictions for bars and restaurants, including mandatory masks and regular screenings of staff. The Ontario government has officially launched a commission of inquiry into a real tragedy of this pandemic. It will look at how COVID-19 was able to grip long-term care facilities. And it will ask, did the province do enough? Ellen Morrow explains. Maria Tomaszewski, happy and vibrant before COVID-19 ravaged her long-term care home. Seen here in her final days, Tomaszewski became one of more than 1,800 long-term care residents to die in Ontario. Anger does come in a little bit. You think about why weren't uh, precautions taken. Henry Tomaszewski is Maria's son. Now hoping with Ontario's Commission of Inquiry, his loss won't have been in vain. Sometimes it, it takes a, a, a disaster for society to realize that there's flaws in the system and it needs to be changed. Commissioners will be independent, able to call witnesses and hold public hearings as they examine how so many died. No stone will be left unturned. But the final report won't be allowed to assign civil or criminal responsibility to any person or organization, and it's unclear if any recommendations will be binding. It didn't need to get this bad, and it did. Yes, yeah, Dr. Samir Sinha says the system's the, shortcomings the have, have been obvious so for years. No we grossly underfund our system. We have outdated facilities. We have poorly paid staff. The province has announced plans to build new homes, but Sinha says fixing chronic understaffing should be the top priority with the threat of a second wave. How can we promise to build new beds when we can't even properly organize care in the ones that we have today? How was your lunch? It was good. No one will be watching the commission more closely than those with loved ones in care like Ali Shah. Shah celebrated his 42nd anniversary with his wife Nyla at her care home just days ago. Nyla recovered from COVID in the spring. Azim Shah is the couple's son. I have a bit of faith for improvement, but it'll take a longer fight from society to improve the long-term care system because it's a completely broken and gutted system. A system where so many lives were lost. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Toronto. With less than 100 days remaining until Election Day, U.S. President Donald Trump went to Texas to defy detractors, define political enemies, and celebrate some victories. Because as long as I'm president, we will always put America first. It's very simple, very simple. But not mentioned by Trump, a U.S. COVID-19 milestone. Today, it surpassed 150,000 total deaths. From July 1st, when average daily deaths hit a low of about 400, now more than 1,000 American lives are being lost every day. Those statistics cannot be helping Trump's campaign. And as Katie Simpson shows us, the clue that he's concerned isn't just about where his poll numbers are, it's about where he is. Texas isn't exactly known as a battleground state. An election year trip to Texas for a Republican incumbent is a sign all is not well in the president's world. Donald Trump is looking to build some momentum as his support in traditionally safe territory starts to slip. We will defend your jobs. We will defend the Lone Star State. I love this state. According to a morning consult poll, Joe Biden has a two-point lead over Trump in Texas. It's a significant change from late May when the same poll had Trump with an eight-point lead. He should not have to campaign one day in red Texas. Losing Texas would be uh, an earth-shattering moment in American politics. The president's handling of COVID is a factor in his popularity. Texas has become a hot spot with more than 400,000 cases and 6,500 deaths. I don't have any of the symptoms that are listed as part of COVID-19, but apparently I have 
the Wuhan virus. Louis Gohmert, a Republican congressman from Texas who was supposed to travel home with the president, is one of the latest cases. He wasn't wearing a mask walking the halls of Congress near the attorney general yesterday and now questions their value. When I have a mask on, I'm, I'm moving it to make it comfortable. And I can't help but wonder if that you know, put some germs in the mask. We will always put America first. Trump and some members of his party have struggled to show they are taking the crisis seriously by questioning science and public health experts. Though he's tried to embrace a more urgent tone recently, one the public seems to want. Together we will end the plague from China. We will defeat the virus. If Trump can't win over voters through his handling of COVID, expect him to lean into even more divisive rhetoric. He's already trying to paint Democrats as far left extremists who won't be able to keep Americans safe. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. In Oregon, a deal seems to have been reached to withdraw federal officers from downtown Portland, but tonight the president made it clear their removal comes with some conditions. They want to solve their problem. They've got a very short time to do it, but they'll either solve their problem or we send in the National Guard. Earlier today, the state governor tweeted that federal agents would be leaving as early as tomorrow and then be replaced by local and state troopers. The city has been rocked by 62 consecutive days of demonstrations. Health officials are bracing for a second wave of COVID-19 in the fall, but that's also when we typically see a surge in another virus, the flu. If you had flu, if you had COVID, it's going to be really hard to tell. Next on the national, why flu season may not be as bad as we fear. Your COVID-19 questions answered, including, is it safe to pull down my mask and leave it under my chin when I don't need to use it? The doctor is in. And she's finally been found. The search is over for a stolen teddy bear with a message from a dying mother to her daughter. Did it. Home. The good news we were all hoping for. We're back in two. Welcome back. While the world is preoccupied with the pandemic, flu season in Canada is just around the corner. Christine Birak looks at concerns about COVID overlapping with influenza and whether we'll have enough vaccine to go around. After a family vacation in Las Vegas, Lisa Audette thought she had the flu. Really intense headache, nausea, fatigue, malaise. My whole body was sore. Uh, also, my eyes were stinging, which was a little bit different for a flu. Turns out she had COVID-19. If you had flu, if you had COVID, it's going to be really hard to tell. Testing will help. However, with the flu season looming, many are worried about overlapping outbreaks. <laughs> But scientists say we may have already had a preview of what's coming. Back in March, flu season wasn't over when COVID-19 arrived and the results were striking. It was not a gradual um, easing off of influenza activity. It really was a sudden dramatic drop. In 2019, stats show about 15% of flu tests were positive in the third week of March. That was about 1,000 cases. This year, at the same time, that line plummets. Public health measures for COVID-19 had kicked in and flu cases dropped to under 200. Another good sign comes from the current flu season underway in the Southern Hemisphere. Many countries there followed public health messaging and are seeing very low levels of flu virus. The main message for countries of the North, prepare with a lot of caution uh, your flu season. Adding the uptake of flu vaccines has shot up in the South this year. In Australia, the number of flu deaths has dropped from 430 in 2019 to just 36 this year. You know, I think it'd be great if we had um, no influenza activity like we're seeing in the Southern Hemisphere, but I don't know if we can count on that. So what we're really planning for is what if we have flu and COVID at that same time? To that end, Health Canada has ordered almost 2 million extra flu shots, hoping more Canadians will be eager to roll up their sleeves for a protective vaccine that is ready. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. An irreplaceable stolen teddy bear is back with its owner. Thousands help spread the word around the world, the stranger who tracked it down ahead. But first, the doctor is here to answer your questions, as in, should people self-isolate as a precaution after traveling to and from other provinces? The answer, right after the break.
right, welcome back. Time now for your COVID-19 questions. With me tonight, infectious diseases specialist, Dr. Zane Chagla. Thank you for being with us. Let's get right to it. This one is interesting. We see people do this all the time. Is it safe to pull down my mask and leave it under my chin when I don't need to use it? So no, that is probably the worst thing you can do with the mask because that outside of the mask is, is where all the bacteria and the viruses get caught from other people. If you're leaving it dangling on your chin, they're basically going to contaminate your chin and the lower lip, which means that you're putting all that stuff basically in your mouth and defeating the whole purpose of wearing a mask. So you take a mask off, take it by the ear loops, put it away, wash your hands, but don't let it dangle by your chin. Excellent. Okay, what do we know about how many COVID-19 patients get severely sick compared to those with only mild symptoms? So from the Canadian experience, there's been about 115,000 cases. About 10% of them have required hospitalization. Uh, about 2.5% of them have required an intensive care stay. Uh, and about 8% of them have died. Now, it's, it's, it's important that, that, that the testing numbers don't necessarily reflect everyone. At the beginning, we didn't test everyone necessarily with the milder cases. So those percentages are probably a bit lower. If you look at the, the numbers, including some of the serology studies, the fatality rate is somewhere between 0.1 and 2%, depending on the population you take a look at. Okay, so this one is interesting. It's a time when people are trying to travel. Should people self-isolate as a precaution after traveling to and from other provinces? So it's important from the provinces that have higher COVID incidents, Ontario, Alberta, British Columbia, uh, and Quebec, if you're going to areas with lower prevalences, so Saskatchewan, the Maritimes, uh, Manitoba, the territories, then yes, that isolation for 14 days is important because you could be seeding those communities that haven't seen a lot of transmission. But if you're going between Ontario, Quebec, Alberta, and British Columbia themselves, then your risk where you are versus the risk where you visit is about the same. So it's not that important to isolate in that setting. Okay, great to see you, Dr. Chagla. Thanks very much. No problem. All the best. As you know, we're asking your questions about COVID-19 as often as possible. So send us the questions you have. Message us directly on Instagram at CBC The National or you can send us an email at covid at cbc.ca. Next, an emotional reunion after an exhaustive search in Vancouver. She was vibrating just knowing that the bear was there and until we pulled out of the bag. We couldn't even get it fully out of the bag before she snagged it up and hit the ground crying. A stolen teddy bear with a message from a dying mother to her daughter. The bear has been found. A good news story after the break. Welcome back. So stolen teddy bears rarely get international attention, but this is no ordinary bear and these are not ordinary times. This is a moment when we all need a story to end well, and this one does. After a five day search, the stolen bear with a special, special message found its way home. And here's Tina Lovegreen with the reunion. Back in her arms, where it belongs. Mara Soriano spent five days searching the streets of Vancouver for this teddy bear. If you ever see it anywhere, there's a cash rewards. A gift from her mother who passed away from cancer last year with a special message. It's just the last thing I have of hers. It has her voice on it and it says, I love you, I'm proud of you, and I'll always be with you. And when you miss someone that much, sometimes you need to hear that. But on Friday, while she was busy moving, someone stole her backpack with her iPad and the bear in it. In just days, the story of the stolen bear made it around the world, appearing on ABC's Live with Kelly and Ryan. The thing that was special about this stuffed bear. Vancouver-born movie star Ryan Reynolds even offering a $5,000 reward for the bear's safe return. Steven Sharanowski found the bear while he was searching for his friend's stolen bike and last night returned it to its rightful owner right here at CBC Vancouver. She was like just static waiting. We couldn't even get it fully out of the bag before she snagged it up and hit the ground crying. Sharanowski has been living in this tent city in Vancouver's Strathcona Park for about a month now. He lost his mother a few years ago too and knows the pain of having something sentimental stolen. 
I know how much it means to get stuff back when, when you lose it, right? Especially something that's so touching. As for the reward, he says a friend of Ryan Reynolds contacted him and took his banking information, but he hasn't checked to see if the money's there yet. He's just happy the bear is back where it belongs. Guys, we found her, we did it. <laughs> it's the reunion we all needed. Tina Lovegreen, CBC News, Vancouver. Next, inside Masai Ujiri's Giants of Africa. How good is this day at the office? It's the best day. It's the best day ever. How the Raptors president is using basketball to change lives, inspire, and empower. Where in every player's room they put pictures of their family. Pascal Siakam to the rim. The Toronto Raptors restart their run for a second NBA title this weekend. They've been tuning up in their Disney World bubble playing scrimmage and winning two of their three games. The real deal begins Saturday night against the Los Angeles Lakers. Raptors president Masai Ujiri is, of course, with the team in Florida. This time of year, though, he's usually an ocean away. Ujiri was raised in Nigeria, and in the summer, he tends to return to the continent of Africa, taking with him a series of basketball camps. His Giants of Africa program holds a special place in his heart for what it does, what it gives, and what it leaves behind. Last summer, we went along to see. the Toronto Raptors and I look at Kawhi and I looked at Coach Nurse and everybody working together okay for one goal to win and that's how we should work in our countries one goal to win and you guys have to do that you guys have to make the country better everybody understand the Pied Piper has called them all this is Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, and they are the eager, nervous new faces of the Giants of Africa basketball camp. What does drive look like here? It looks like six foot seven, 15 year old Freddy Dede. The smile of a kid hanging on the slimmest of chances, he's good enough to be noticed. He needs that. Freddy's an orphan, he's not in school. Jazz Mayombo. Joseph Peters, there in the Miami shirt, isn't in school either. It's too expensive. So to get new gear is huge. What's on your sock? This one is my picture. His prized possession until now, a pair of well-loved socks with his own face on them. All right, you're going to get to know all of us through camp. We're going to give you our first name, what country you're from, and we give two claps. Coach Jamma from Swaziland. Good, here we go. On a continent dominated by soccer, this is an oddity, and that's the point. All those coaches, some of the NBA and WNBA's finest. They're here to push a whole generation to try something different and to get good at it. Here we go now. We're going to start playing some basketball right away. When you play basketball, you're going to dribble that rock and get really good. Pop, 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 pop. to let basketball be their passport to the future. No kidding, Masai Ujiri is exhausted. Hi. <laughs> this camp is the creation of the Raptors president. He's been running it for years and this summer crossed the continent with it. Rwanda, Somalia, Cameroon, South Sudan. Everywhere evangelizing the lessons of sports, of his sport. If they ask me, what's your name? I say, my name is Masai Ujiri and I'm from Nigeria. Yeah? What's your name? Yes, what's your name? The way you are sitting already, you are not telling me your name properly. Tell me your name. They can't hear you. Tell me your name. Okay, good. You need to be confident with yourselves. 
There is a fierceness here and a loyalty. What's your favorite team? <laughs> right here. Yes, you. What's your favorite team? Golden State? Golden State? Um. <laughs> hey, the moral of the story is if you come to the Giants of Africa camp, your favorite team is the Toronto Raptors. There is heft at this camp. Masai has brought along Patrick Engelbrecht. He's a global scout for the Raptors. You gotta take these skills home, practice them, share them with your teammates. My man, come on up. And Jama Malalela, the head coach of the Raptors G League affiliate team. We give you a nice clap, and once you hear the rhythm going, you show it to us. Ready? both born on the continent, as was almost every other coach here. Many of us reached our dreams this past season, and I think what's really important is that the kids see that represented. When we introduce ourselves, we say, hi, I'm Coach Jam from Swaziland. I'm Coach Godwin from Nigeria. That means something, because it's a coach who's in front of them that they view as a Westerner, but really, we're from here as well. Representation is fundamental to the camp, so there's always a thought to introduce the kids to the stars in their midst. You gotta make the most of this. You gotta pay attention to everything that's been said to you. And so, seven foot three Tanzanian Hashim Tabit, the only person from East Africa to ever play in the NBA. The life he has is Joseph's biggest dream, so he gets as close as he can, which is not really that close. And there's the hope and the heartbreak of this camp. Both Freddie and Joseph know they will get three intensive days of exposure to the sport's very best. And then as fast as they came, the Giants will be gone. success of a program like this, aside from the looks on some of these faces. Well, the fact is, none of the campers from the Giants of Africa have yet made it to the NBA or the WNBA, but at least 150 of them have gone on to get basketball scholarships at colleges and universities around the world, most of them to the United States. Those scholarships mean good educations, which means good jobs, which means doors open by basketball for a lot of kids that otherwise would have stayed totally closed. Freddie, number 61 there, still needs to work on his skills. Joseph, though, is a standout. He's fast and confident, but that might not be enough. What did they say to you today that really sticks in your head? You play smart, and you need to go into school. Yeah, me, I need to go into school. My find is no job. Man, I'm going to school. Not going to school isn't just Joseph's problem, it's Tanzania's. The costs can be out of reach for a lot of kids, and that's when dreams can die. So, Joseph, tell me about school. When, when did you stop going to school? 24, 2014, I'm still. That was years ago, and now he has way too much time to think about what he's lost. Once, he had a high school basketball scholarship to Uganda, but after an injury, he was dumped. Now he plays anywhere he can. As in, I'm free. I'm come back. His body has healed, but that spirit has not. Why does that make you sad? Basketball for Tanzania is not easy. You play, you don't give you anything. You play, you play. I've played a long time. Nothing ever seems to come of it. This is a kid who feels trapped. There's both need and potential everywhere. <laughs> What's your favorite NBA team? Hey, Toronto everywhere. Yeah. Momentarily leaving the camp behind, Masai heads an hour out of Dar es Salaam to a rural school and its dusty clay court full of kids 
who seems so familiar. I went to a secondary school um, just like this in northern Nigeria. It doesn't matter where you grow up. It doesn't matter where you go to school. You can become something. So what I'm trying to tell you is that if my dumb ass can do it, you guys can do it even better. Yeah? Masai never made it to the NBA as a player. He found another way and needs them to see options too. And don't think he's resting on his laurels. Everybody tells me I'm the first president in all of sports from Africa. If I'm the only one, it's a failure. Yeah, but if I bring others along and one day I can say there are many more, that means it was a success. Yeah. I guarantee you that one of those kids there is going to become something big. From in, that school? Yes, from that school. Guarantee. That's what you want. That's what I want Giants of Africa to be all about. And there are noticeable changes. On the last day, we catch a glimpse of Freddie finding his voice. He's 15 and shy, but behaving like the leader. And don't think that isn't seen by the coaches. Come time to announce a coveted spot in the all-star team, guess who gets called? Not just his dreams, Joseph gets the call too. Number 11, that's him flying down the court. And then before his new rock as pals, he plays to win. And they all notice. In the last moments of the camp, an MVP is chosen. And look who it is. Joseph is one of the smallest players here, but he shines. Yeah, champion. As thrilled as his pals and coaches are, his face says something different. He's serious and a bit crushed. The camp is minutes from ending. The coaches are about to go home, but he'll stay put. We asked what he would do next. Just work harder, he said. He needs a break, but don't count him out. Don't count any of them out. That faith is Masai's fuel. How good is this day in the office? Oh, it's the best day. It's the best day ever. <laughs> well, maybe not the best day ever. Yeah, yeah the best day ever was uh, in Golden State, but yeah, yeah the second best day. <laughs> He's not building schools or drilling wells for water. The Giants of Africa is a seed. That it grows is now up to them. Before the pandemic, Masai Ujiri had planned to take the Giants of Africa to Rwanda this summer and expected 200 young people from 11 countries. Of course, that had to be cancelled. But he still hopes for a mini camp in one country and a few coaches before the end of this year. Next, a summer drink you've probably never heard of. It was popular 100 years ago, and because of a Calgary researcher, it's making a return. Next, in our moment. Everything old eventually becomes new again, and this time it's a drink called Kronk. A Calgary researcher recently revived the century-old beverage. So he found references to the mystery drink in old newspaper articles. He got curious. He took the idea to Twitter, of course, and now Kronk is coming back. And that's our moment. One of the things I like to do on Twitter is, is sort of share fun things from old newspapers. I guess it was the fifth edition of the Calgary Herald, and in the local news section, I just saw the word cronk. So I thought, 
okay, I have to look more. And then I, I looked around the page and it was like, it just said, Dr. Kronk, drink Kronk. Kronk is the drink. It's like a low alcohol uh, kind of root beer inspired maybe beer. Within a couple of hours, people were submitting all sorts of types of research into Kronk because they were intrigued by these ads. Someone had found the, the recipe. People uh, found like the old bottles. And then Wednesday morning, Cold Garden tweets out that they've started ordering the ingredients and they're gonna start brewing up a batch of Kronk. At the very least, it'll be like a, the, the pandemic drink of the, the summer. I hopes. So that subversive advertising was in the 1883 edition of the Calgary Herald. Uh, apparently, early batches taste like a mix between uh, root beer and kombucha. I don't know. We'll see. That is the National for July 29th.